Hello, I'm Annalisa McDaniel. I'm a drainage and wastewater planner with Seattle Public Utilities. I'd like to welcome you all to this Shape Our Water Summer Speaker Series event. And as a reminder, Shape Our Water is a community-centered project from Seattle Public Utilities to plan the next 50 years of Seattle's drainage and wastewater systems. And as part of this project, we're hosting the Summer Speaker Series that's, that is featuring experts in the fields of urban water management and community resilience. And before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the event is being recorded and we'll have a presentation today and then a question and answer session will follow and that will be moderated by Rosie Jenks uh, from Brown and Caldwell. And so you can, there she is. You can save your questions until the end or you can put them in the chat. Uh, Jesse, who's also here from Brown and Caldwell is gonna be monitoring the chat during our presentation. Um, and today our esteemed speaker is Dr. Philip Thompson. Dr. Thompson is the director of Seattle, the Seattle University Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability, and is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. His areas of research and teaching include hazardous waste remediation, drinking water, and wastewater treatment. Dr. Thompson joined Seattle University after receiving a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Iowa in 1997. He also earned an MS in environmental engineering and a BA in biology from the University of Iowa. And he is a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington. He's been a principal engineer for Northwest Engineers LLC since 2001, where he has worked on a range of infrastructure projects. With his work through the Seattle University chapter of engineers for a sustainable world, over 20 international water projects have been completed in places such as Haiti, Thailand, Nicaragua, Peru, and Zambia. He has served as a consultant for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Reinvent the Toilet Project. For the Bullet Center, his work has provided a collection of lessons learned that will inform future projects, policies, and practices that may assist with the design and implementation of future innovative water systems. So welcome, Dr. Thompson. We are looking forward to your presentation. And please take it away. Thanks, Annalisa. Can, I, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, all right, yes. Great. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to come uh, talk to you today um, about uh, the work that we've done at the Bullet Center. So i just curious, maybe if someone's monitoring the chat, how many folks have actually been to the Bullet Center, taken a tour? We have about 20 people. I don't know if people can ring in, raise their hands. Um, I can't really see that. Do we got a number? Just to kind of get a sense of where we are with the audience. I see a, a couple couple hands raised so far and one yes, uh, two yeses in the chat. Uh, okay. Not yet, but I've heard about it. Okay. Uh, that's that's kind of what I that's kind of what I thought. So that's great. So most of you probably aren't too familiar with the Bullet Center. Um, which opened in spring on Earth Day 2013. So today I'm going to give you just a bit of an overview of the Bullet Center, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the drinking water treatment system, the wastewater treatment systems, uh, as well as uh, some implications for the future. So a quick quiz. If we removed all the vehicles in the USA tomorrow, how much would this decrease our carbon footprint as a nation? So I'll let you think about that. Maybe uh, folks can can chime in on the on the chat. I'm using I'm using the uh, browser version of Teams, so maybe that's why I can't see certain things. Um, so we have a, a guess of let's see, we've got a thirty five percent, twenty percent. 30%, 20%, got a couple of 60%, 40%. Okay. So all right. We're all over the board. <laughs> all over the map. All right. So, uh, so whoever guessed 20%, uh, you get 100% for today's quiz. So what that tells us, though, is, is that buildings are really, the heating and cooling of buildings is really uh, responsible for a significant part of our carbon footprint. It's not so much transportation. I think a lot of people think about transportation and electric cars, but that's not, not, a, not a very big portion. And so uh, maybe you folks know who Dennis Hayes is. So Dennis Hayes founded Earth Day back in 1970, 
and uh, he's also the president of the Bullet Foundation. And so, um, this idea to build the Bullet Center um, really comes out of um, reducing our carbon footprint as a nation by building more efficient buildings. And so here's a little photo of the Bullet Center. If, if you ever want a tour of the Bullet Center, you can let me know that I, I, uh, I have a key. I can take, take folks on tours, but also the University of Washington's Integrated Design Lab um, uh, also provides tours. Um, I think it's right now they're they're on pause for COVID for the for the big group tours. But certainly, if you want a tour of a small group of people, just let me know. I'm happy to take you through the building. But it's located right there on 15th, uh, 15th and Madison. So the idea behind the building is uh, hundreds of years ago we had Douglas fir trees living on that spot, and so maybe we could have a building that behaves just like a Douglas fir tree. That is, it's gonna get all of its power from the sun and it's gonna get all of its, it's, it's gonna get all of its water from the precipitation that hits the building. So this, um, this idea has been uh, promoted by the Living, uh, Living Future Institute. So you can check out Living Future. Uh, it's, it's really, um, I would say a much higher level than LEED. You'll see, I'm sure most of you are familiar with LEED buildings, but Living Future is really trying to get us to that goal of net zero water and net zero energy for our buildings. So the Living Building Challenge, it, it gets updated every so often, but these are uh, the, the petals that, or the different areas that the Living Building Challenge looks at. And I'm gonna walk through these for, our, for the Bullet Center here. So first of all, beauty, I think we can all agree that it really is a beautiful building. Um, and so they, they check the box pretty easily in that one. Energy um, is a really um, interesting one for the bullet center. So you saw all the solar panels on top. So the way it works is you have two power lines. You have one coming in that's so we're, they're consistently drawing power from Seattle Public Utilities. And you have one power line going out and that's the, the green power that's produced by those 525 solar panels on top. And you can see on the left, um, kind of the annual uh, energy production. And on the right, um, we have in the orange, we have the consumption. And since its inception, the building has produced about 40% more power each year than it uses, which really has proven the concept that we can do solar in cloudy, rainy Seattle, no problem. And that's really uh, because in the summertime, we really overproduce, uh, we produce a lot of a lot of power in the summertime. And so I think that this proof of concept really, really shows that more, more folks should be adopting uh, solar uh, going forward, especially as solar prices drop. So the building uh, doesn't use any fossil fuels, of course, for heating and cooling and relies on uh, ground source heat pumps. So it's always about um, uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit um, at depth here. So, so there's um, there's 26 uh, groundwater wells that go about 400 feet deep into the earth. And um, through the, the power of mechanical engineering and compressors and so forth, we can, um, in, the, in the wintertime, we can heat our building. Uh, and in the, in the summertime, we can cool our building. And so many of you are probably familiar with radiant floor heating. And so that's, that's what's going throughout um, the entire building is, is radiant floor heating and, and cooling. And it really does a tremendous job um, of, of heating and cooling the building. On the equity front, uh, most, if not all of the offices uh, in the Bullet Center uh, have this open office concept and we really try to enhance the uh, livability or the work, the works spaces themselves by having all the workstations near uh, operable windows so uh, folks can control their their own uh, microclimates if you will and then because of this uh, open office concept there's there's uh, several sort of private offices that you can go into if you have a conference call or whatnot so in terms of health uh, we have the uh, irresistible staircase so they built this really beautiful staircase um, that invites you to, to take the stairs rather than being off in a gray, gray stairwell somewhere on the side of the building. It's really, um, really invites you up this beautiful staircase. It's a six-story building. 
Uh, we've got some operable windows. Uh, so the, the, the entire building is, is controlled by a, a computer that opens and closes these windows based on the indoor and outdoor air temperature. And uh, there's some blinds on the outside that um, also raise and, and lower uh, based on the temperature uh, in the building. So that, that happens throughout the day. I'm going to kind of give you the quick tour here. I won't get into try to stay out of the weeds a little bit. Um, on, on the materials front, so none of the building materials contain any hazardous materials whatsoever. So this is what they call the red list. And so uh, the architects and engineers that uh, put this building together had to vet all of the building materials to make sure that none of them contain hazardous materials. Uh, it's a primary, primarily it's a timber construction building from the third floor up. Um, and so uh, all, of the, all of the wood is sourced. It's uh, Forest Stewardship Council um, wood for, from Idaho. And so it's, and as you can see, it really, really adds a, a beautiful, um, a beautiful finish to the building. In terms of sight, uh, there's maybe you've heard of walk score, so it's really got a pretty maxed out walk score of 99, and so that's great. There's no, no parking um, is available in the building, so that was one of the variances that the city of Seattle provided to the building uh um when it was when it was being uh, designed so that they didn't they weren't required to have parking provide parking because the whole goal of the building was to um, reduce carbon footprint and encourage walking and public transit as well as biking there's bike facilities for for bikers and uh, showers and and uh, secure uh, storage and so forth so now to water so that's what we're here to talk about here today and so um as I mentioned, the building uh, can, it pro it, it processes all the rainwater and converts it to potable water. Um, and then the gray water uh, for the building is also treated. So you can see this wetland. I'm going to go through these uh, here individually. And then all of the toilets um, in the building historically have been uh, composting toilets. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into that here as well. So first, in terms of the uh, potable water uh, system highlights, um, so all of, all of the water system um, design was governed by uh, the Washington Department of Health. So it's, it's a class A private water system. So if you're gonna provide water to the general public, uh, you have to go through the Department of Health process. Of course, if you're an individual, a homeowner, and you wanted to do this, you, you wouldn't have to do that. It's kind of at your own risk. Um, but because uh, we have a lot of visitors to the Bullet Center, it had to go through the Department of Health process. Of course, it complies with the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, and there's a very slight chlorine residual of about one and a half milligrams per liter uh, throughout the building. When they first um, were designing the potable water system, there was an effort to really avoid chlorine um, because chlorine, of course, is a hazardous material. And um, so Dennis Hayes, uh, Got on the got on the phone with the folks at EPA and the head of the water division at EPA uh, said, you know, it takes it took us about 20 years to get the chlorine rules passed. Uh, there's no way that Congress is gonna uh, gonna give you a variance on this one. And, and so um, so as a result, um, the living building challenge was changed to uh, have an exemption for chlorine. So in terms of the hazardous materials that are in the building, the only one. Uh, that's exempt is chlorine. Um, and then the other uh, kind of lesson learned by the designers on this potable water system, and so the original designers um, were unaware of some of these things, so they had never really worked uh, or designed a potable water system for, for, from rainwater, and so it was, it was really a steep learning curve. Um, and so one of the things that was learned is that all of the treatment components have to be certified by the National Sanitation Foundation. So the National Sanitation Foundation, the other NSF. So this is a nice, one of my favorite photos here from the roof of the building. And I'm showing you this because the, the treatment system for potable water didn't go online until 2018, five years after the building was opened. And one of the reasons for that was in addition to understanding that there was this Department of Health uh, process that had to be um, followed. Uh, so with that, um, every drop of water that goes through your watershed 
it has, we have to sort of follow the path of that drop of water through the watershed to make sure that it never comes into contact with hazardous materials. And so one of the question marks was the solar panel. So the solar panels had, themselves had never been tested for um, whether or not they leached any hazardous materials. And so that testing process took a couple of years um, to get lined up and the solar panel manufacturers were willing to foot the bill for that because they wanted uh, they wanted to have their future customers uh, adopt their solar panels. And, and so it took a while to get that going. So once that was done, they could move forward with the, with the, uh, with the design process. And so, uh, and so, of course, if you're gonna rely on, on precipitation for providing all of your potable water needs, you need to have some understanding of uh, how much it rains. And of course, we, have, we all know that uh, in the summer months, it's pretty dry. And in the other months, it's, it's, it's much rainier. And so that had to be accounted for. Um, and so the goal for the building is to always have about three months of storage. So we have this bottom row here, days of storage. On average, the goal is to have about three months of storage um, always available. Um, and of course, one way to achieve that was to have, fortunately, this really large solar array. So this is about a 7,000 square foot uh, capture area um, that was used and so that really that really allows um, allows for that storage to happen. Um, incidentally, this was a um, another variance that the city of Seattle um, kindly gave the the Bullet Foundation. So as you can see, the uh, solar array extends out into the right of way. And so normally you can't build in the right of way, of course, um, but this was allowed because they figured, hey, nobody's using that that right of way six stories up there. So we'll go ahead and let you. Uh, to you know, build out, we'll give you a variance for that. And that really um, helped them uh, make this project happen. And so, of course, one of the costs associated with this building was all of the barriers that the Bullet Foundation had to sort of, they were the first, first to overcome. And so hopefully folks down the line who decide to adopt some of these um, approaches to green or sustainable building design uh, won't have to spend much money uh, negotiating with the city. All right, so this is the treatment system uh, kind of overview. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in here and, and kind of give you a, just a quick quick overview. So the water comes down uh, from the roof and there's a little uh, vortex separator that's gonna separate out any large debris such as leaves and um, uh, things of that nature. And then the untreated water is stored in a 52,000 gallon uh, underground uh, concrete uh, cistern. Uh, so after that, the water is first treated by a five micron filter. So um, a hair on your head is about 50 microns in diameter. So five microns, so one tenth of a diameter of your hair. So we're going to get out all the particles. Um, so then um, the, the system ultimately, um, its initial stage of disinfection is ultraviolet light disinfection. On either side of that UV unit, uh, we have a 0.5 micron uh, carbon filter. So those carbon filters are gonna help us um, remove any dissolved organic carbon uh, that might be in the water. Um, so after, um, after the UV uh, disinfection, um, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of calcium carbonate is added to buffer the system. We don't want any of those copper pipes leaching copper into the drinking water. And so um, we buffer it with calcium carbonate, and then we add some uh, chlorine, and then we had to had to put in uh, some enough piping so that we had adequate chlorine contact. So I think some of you probably know about chlorine contact requirements. Um, and then uh, there's a 500 gallon uh, day tank, so there's always about 500 gallons of treated water available uh, for the for the building every day. Um, and after after the storage tank essentially gets pumped up to all of the uh, all the fixtures in the building. All right, so there's kind of a shot of uh, the maybe you've heard of the big blue filters uh, and, and the five micron and 0.5 micron filters. There's some the additional uh, piping that had to be put in for uh, chlorine contact. And so if we look at some of the design assumptions for the building, so initially it was assumed um, 
for the tenants, there would be a water demand of about 240 gallons per day and visitors and events um, would, would add an additional about 110 gallons per day. So total initial expected water, demand, average daily water demand was about 350 gallons. Um, so I, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, the building uses very low flow uh, fixtures, which has really contributed a lot. So the composting toilets use just a little bit of uh, a little bit of water, a couple of tablespoons or so of water that was mixed with a soap or surfactant, and that's how the the uh, toilets would be flushed. So you'd go in there, the toilet would turn on, it would sense you a little bit of um, a little bit of soap would be uh, sent down the toilet and then you would just do your thing and, and, and away we go. So that's a low, a low amount of water and compared to a traditional uh, 1.6 gallons per flush. Of course, the urinals don't use any water and then the faucets are very uh, low flow as well. So if you look at the actual uh, demand uh, in terms of, first we can, maybe we'll just look at the peak hourly demand is very, very consistent, um, right around uh, five gallons per minute. But the, uh, the average daily demand was well below that 350 number that we saw. So you can see that it really kind of fluctuated, or pre-COVID fluctuated uh, between 150 and 200 uh, gallons per day. And really that's attributed both to the low flow fixtures, but also I think the tenant mindset and the folks just entering the building being consci you know, conscientious of how much water they're using. So it was, it was um, definitely a lot less flow than expected. And then of course you can see uh, when COVID-19 uh, hit, the, the flow for the building dropped when everybody went home to work. Um, so look at the raw water characteristics. So um, of the rainwater that's uh, been stored in that storage tank. So the pH, a little bit acidic, so a little bit of CO2 in there. It's gonna keep that pH a little below where we'd like it to be. The turbidity is very low. So, um, I mean, that is outstanding uh, water quality to start with, for sure. Uh, relatively low alkalinity, total dissolved solids. And then uh, there was some coliform bacteria due to um, our friends, the birds. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think we all know how that works. <laughs> okay, so there's our raw water characteristics. Very, very clean water, not, not, a, not a real, uh, real problem for our drinking water treatment system. So we look at the finished water characteristics then. We, so we raise the pH so it's not corrosive for those copper pipes throughout the building. Really consistent temperature. Uh, there's that free chlorine that I mentioned. Uh, that's at the point of entry, but then we have to measure the chlorine at the furthest point from the treatment system, which is on the sixth floor there. Um, it's uh, pretty consistent, right around half a milligram per liter of chlorine. The treated uh, water turbidity is excellent uh, as well. Alkalinity is fairly stable. And then there are still some disinfection by byproducts well below uh, the, the uh, maximum contaminant levels, um, but you're, you're still gonna have those disinfection byproducts because you're using chlorine and there is a little bit of dissolved organic carbon still in the water. Um, so just a little quick shot of the turbidity. We can see that the treatment, the, the effluent is very consistently low over time. Um, and then we have um, the influent turbidity, which I mean, it, it seems to go up a little bit um, as we get into the summer months. So you're kind of down towards the bottom of the barrel, as it were. Uh, but again, it's very, very low NTUs on that. Um, uh, and then once it starts raining, the turbidity goes down. We've diluted that anything that might be in the uh, in the cistern. And then just a quick shot of the uh, uh, chlorine concentrations are are very consistent um, in that. Um, for this point from the from the point of entry, uh, right around just between 0.5 and 1 milligrams per liter of chlorine. So the treatment system works great, very consistent uh, water quality coming in and leaving. So let's talk a little bit about the cost. And I think this is really where the rub is on the drinking water side. So if we just look at the capital expenses, so uh, there needed to be a uh, non-toxic um, roofing material below uh, below the uh, solar panels themselves. And so that membrane material was, as you can see, pretty expensive, $75,000. Uh, the cistern itself, the treatment system, uh, the, uh, the rest of the goodies, meters, valves, and piping. So 
if you annualize that using a 3% discount rate, it's about $7,000 a year over 30 years. Then we have the annual operating expense. So this is really where um, it, it starts to be a bit of a, a challenge. And so we have water system operation. And so because it is a public water system, you have to have a certified operator and you have to have daily testing of that system. And so that expense, if you combine that expense, you're really looking at about $60,000 a year that, um, that a building uh, owner would have to um, have to agree to in order to provide uh, water for its for their building, and so that's a really um, significant expense. Now, you might be able to lower this expense, or you would be able to lower this expense if you had multiple buildings in your neighborhood that were making their own water, and you could share that system operator and, and testing service. And so that would be one way to to get this cost down. But as you can see, um, the annual operating cost of about $60,000 really um, for a lot of owners, that's, a, that's not very appealing. So you add that annualized cost to your capital, annualized capital cost, so you're looking at an annual cost of about $67,000. And if you made all of the water, of course, the, the building itself doesn't use 126 gallons, 126,000 gallons a year, but if it did, you could get your cost per gallon down to about 53 cents. And of course, all of you at Seattle Public Utilities know that, and all of us that live in Seattle that pay water bills know that it's less than a, a penny per gallon. Uh, it's about 8. 0.8 cents per gallon, I think is, is the going rate for water. So it's much more expensive. It's a lot cheaper than, uh, than bottled water, of course, uh, but it's still pretty expensive water. All right, so I'm going to uh, switch topics now a little bit and talk about the gray water system. So that's all the water that goes down the sinks and showers and the floor drains. And so there's uh, a recirculating gravel filter system. This whole system is regulated by Department of Health as well. Um, sort of interesting note is that the BOD5 and total suspended solids, rather than being regulated on a concentration, so 30 milligrams per liter for both of those is what's normal for a, uh, a wastewater treatment system. Uh, instead of a concentration basis, Department of Health agreed uh, to a mass basis. I'll explain that here in a second. And then the coliform limit was set at 1,000 uh, CFUs per 1,000 mils. So on the third floor balcony, you can see here on the left, we have a wetland. So it's kind of neat. I always thought that was cool that they have a treatment wetland on the building. So there's a little shot there. So that's a horsetail. It's been planted in about 100 horsetail plants or so. And they, they grow uh, really well in the wetland. They get a haircut every year or two, or twice a year, once or twice a year, uh, usually once a year. Um, and so uh, underneath that uh, system, of course, is, is the piping. And you can see uh, this is a, they don't use gravel. Uh, they don't use peat gravel. This is actually a ceramic material that is much, it's much lighter than gravel. Um, but it still provides the surface area for those bacteria to grow because it's really the bacteria uh, that are doing the work in this gray water treatment system. After the water's been treated in the, in the wetland, it goes down uh, into a drain field. Uh, um, as you can see here, uh, that percolates down into the aquifer below. And so one of the lessons learned from this system is so right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, um, the water from the gray water wetland comes through a pipe and then down into the strain field. Well, there was no way to, to economically retrofit anything or, or make any modifications to the system if, if you wanted to reuse this water or if you wanted to add any, um, any other treatment components. So that was um, a lesson learned here. Don't design it too tightly because you might have to make some changes. Um, and so uh, in terms of operation and maintenance, you know, there had to be tenant education uh, because, you know, we have kitchens in the building. We want folks to make sure they scrape those plates really well. It's like talking to your roommates um, and uh, making sure we really reduce the organic loading on the on this system. We, there were some um, modifications over time to that recirculation rate. Uh, so basically what happens is the water flows through this uh, gravel bed and then it gets pumped up and recirculated back through the gravel bed over and over again and uh and then there were some other other issues around uh 
the pipes themselves, and I won't get into that, but there was, suffice it to say, there were some maintenance issues at the, at the outset that got solved. And I have, I have papers written on uh, both the water treatment and the waste and the gray water treatment, and so I'm happy to share those uh, with folks. Um, so I had some students do some testing, and so let's see how the gray water wetland performed. And so um, I'm, I'm showing you some data that's from the paper. It's, it was published in 2017. Um, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, but what you can see here is that um, the blue line is the influence. So this is our just our flow coming in, and it um, eventually levels out um, more or less. You get some peaks around holidays and uh, other events uh, coming through here. But if we look at the effluent flow, what's interesting is what you can see here is the effluent flow drops literally to zero in the summer. And, um, and that's really because those horsetail plants are pumping water like crazy. And so as a result, when you're trying to sample uh, that water coming out of the system, you get a few, you get a little bit of water, maybe you get a liter uh, coming out of there, but it's super concentrated. So all the stuff that's in there is really concentrated. So your, your BOD and your total suspended solids concentration is gonna be way over 30 milligrams per liter. And so that's why uh, Department of Health said, okay, we're, we're going to regulate this based on a mass basis. What's the total mass of BOD5 and total mass of total suspended solids that you're discharging into the aquifer? Uh, that's what we really care about. And so that's that's why uh, they agreed to that. So we look at the BOD uh, treatment for the wetland really works well. So we can see that the influent BOD is on the order of a thousand milligrams per liter and the effluent uh, BOD really consistently after that initial startup phase in the first year or so, once we got those bacteria, those attached growth bacteria all nice and happy on the, on the, uh, on the media, the BOD, effluent BOD is consistently below 10 milligrams per liter. Same with the total suspended solids, really excellent treatment uh, as, as far as total suspended solids as well. Um, e. coli, on the other hand, uh, has been a problem and has continued to be a problem since uh, this data was published in 2017. Um, and so you can see that the green line is the is the thousand CFU permit, and um, every so often, usually in the winter, uh, when the bacteria aren't as aren't as happy, they're a little chilly in the in the wetland, uh, where we see some spikes. So the permit uh, gets exceeded. Um, or has been exceeded even through 2020. We saw uh, exceedances. Um, and so when we saw this early on, the obvious solution would be let's spend 500 bucks and put an inline UV uh, disinfection system uh, on that pipe uh, coming, out of the, coming out of the wetland and we're good to go. Well, again, that's the problem with the initial design is there was no way to you know, practically retrofit a, um, a UV system onto that outflow pipe. And so that was like a big lesson learned for uh, for this treatment system. So to kind of summarize them for the gray water treatment system, at least tenant education, there's excellent uh, BOD and TSS removal. And then, you know, we should always include ultraviolet light disinfection on any of these systems just to make sure that we meet our coliform standards. All right, so almost done here, just a couple more slides. Uh, so we've got um, the black water system here. So those are compost bins you can see over there. Um, so the biosol, so about every two years, the, the, so the, there's wood chips and worms uh, in, in these uh, compost bins. And every two years or so, uh, they would take the biosolids out and mix those with the King County uh, biosolids uh, from the, from the uh, uh, West Point Wastewater Treatment Plant. And, that was how that worked. Now, uh, the liquid that passed through uh, these uh, compost bins was every, about every six weeks, a vacuum truck would arrive at the building, take the liquid away, it cost 1600 bucks every time they showed up, and it would be trucked to Carnation and disposed of at the, car at the wastewater treatment plant in Carnation, the King County treatment plant there. Um, and then subsequently it would go into a wetland. And so I think people kind of, they felt good about uh, the wetland aspect of the treatment, and but at the end of the day, you know, we're using diesel to truck urine, uh, you know, 50 miles round trip, and so you know, does that really make sense? And I, I think if the goal of the building is to reduce its carbon footprint, it, it doesn't really make sense to do that. 
And so uh, hot off the presses, just this past spring, the entire um, Blackwater side has been redesigned. And, and that's because there was a lot of maintenance issues with these compost bins. Um, they were undersized. They didn't have enough com uh, compost bins either. Uh, one of the real problems though was uniform distribution. So each, um, these compost bins were sort of isolated for each floor of the building. So, so they all, because there's different numbers of people on the buildings, sometimes under, on the floors of the buildings, uh, you would get different use. And so kind of the big lesson here was uh, you gotta have a, a uniform t a tank, a mixing tank at, that then distributes um, waste to uh, the different uh, compost bins. And so that wasn't done and that's that has been done now. So PAE, you may be familiar with them, they're a mechanical firm that's in the building, but PAE just uh, uh, built a brand new uh, headquarters down in Portland, and they use they're using composting toilets, but they they've used these lessons learned to size it appropriately and then have a tank uh, that collects all the waste before it's distributed to uh, the compost bins. So they were undersized, um, and there were some maintenance issues, like I said. And so these systems now, because you're kind of locked into the space requirements, uh, have been replaced now with a vacuum system. So it uses very little water, so that's good. It uses a little more energy and uh, more to come on the performance of that vacuum system. Um, so related to that then, um, they wanna they've put in a new gray water treatment system in the basement uh, where the compost bins used to be located. Um, and so uh, the reason is, is because they wanna use gray water from the building to flush the toilets. Um, and so, it, the new gray water treatment system, it's a package system that uses biological treatment. Um, and then uh, there's a zeolite filter followed by activated carbon, a, a five micron sediment filter, UV light. And then after that, uh, the, the, uh, this non-potable water is, is used to flush, uh, flush the toilet. So that, that's all just been recently installed and uh, we're looking at the performance of, of this system as well. So in terms of lessons from the Bullet Center and implications for the future, I think it's um, pretty safe to say that um, adopting solar arrays um, uh, is, is something that all future commercial buildings uh, could do um, and, and, and really kind of help uh, Seattle Public Utilities out uh, in the future as, um, as energy demands uh, increase and maybe our hydropower decreases due to climate change. Uh, we could talk about that sometime. Um, potable water from rainwater. This is a, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the lesson that we've learned here is that it's cost prohibitive unless you have some sort of district level sharing of the testing and, and management um, resource. Uh, in terms of gray water uh, treatment for reuse, it's, it really is, these biological treatment processes are very effective. Um, and and this, these systems could reduce uh, potable water demand uh, that is, we can use this gray water for toilet flushing and irrigation and, and use, less use less potable water for these things in the future. Uh, and then finally, um, to reduce our wastewater flow, of course, low flow fixtures and toilets, uh, it's really um, should be a standard that the city can um, mandate uh, going forward. Um, and then I think composting uh, toilets still have a, have a future as long as they're well designed. So that is almost it. And one thing I wanted to point out was kind of interesting to me, and this is all fairly consistent. We need to encourage more sustainable buildings in Seattle. We have more cranes in the sky than any other city, but we compared to all these other cities, we have the smallest percentage of green buildings, new green buildings. I mean, Manhattan, Atlanta, Houston, San Francisco and so forth, they're all way ahead of us. So we really need to encourage all these builders to adopt uh, sustainable building design uh, or to even mandate it to some extent. So that is all I have for you. If you want to get a hold of me, you can send me an email. With that, um, I will be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Let me see here if I can, hopefully I'm still on the air. Uh, let's see if I get my camera going here. Okay. So with that, um, maybe I can take some questions from the group. I see some hands are up. I, I can do the moderating. Um, thank you so much, Phil. That was wonderful. So interesting. We've already got some eager hands up. So I'm going to take the hands and then um, 
Jesse, can you keep your um, the the uh, comments open? Because I can't have yes. both open at the same time. Great. I can. So we're gonna start with Brent Robinson. Hey there, Brent. Long time no see. Yeah. How you doing? Um, thanks so much for that presentation. Um, question I've got. Um, so the the building's got the storage tank for for the rainwater, right? Because the demand for for the water usage is not exactly when it rains, right? Is there a parallel conversation around, say, like lithium ion battery storage with a solar array? Is that appropriate at like the building scale? Um, just curious if that conversation is also happening and what your insights there are. Yeah, you know, I think that battery storage is 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 definitely a challenge. Um, I think primarily just. You have, to, you have to replace those lithium ion batteries. That lithium has to come from somewhere. And I, I really like the approach that they've used uh, by sharing with Seattle Public Utilities. So, you know, always always drawing power, or consistently drawing power from Seattle Public Utilities to provide that actual direct power for the building. And then just selling back the, um, the, the green power as it's generated to help supplement the grid. Um, I mean, to me, that it's a beautiful, it, it's a beautiful thing because um, you can avoid batteries now. Of course, um, individual homeowners will will have uh, will have Tesla batteries and things like that. But that, that's pretty expensive, and again, you have to replace them. So um, they definitely, you know, thought a lot about it, and I think they're they're going to stick with the, the system as is um, for now. Of course, um, there's advantages to having your own uh, battery banks in case you do lose power, um, but. As far as I know, they're they're not um, they're not considering any any battery storage. Okay, thank you so much. You bet. Any more hands up? Looks like maybe we got some comments in the um, comment. Yeah, so we so we did have one in the chat, but um, it was it was a little bit answered um, in the process. But the question was, does Seattle City Light reimburse the building for excess electricity electricity that is produced? Yes, it's um, I. It's it's uh it's not the it's, I don't know the rate exactly it's it's it they do they do uh they do get they do get some money per kilowatt hour though. Anybody else want to raise their hand with a question? I had a question um that I wanted to ask so I might as well take <laughs> take the yeah. opportunity um what what is the vacuum. What, what what does the vacuum uh, system do? Is it still a water-based system? Does it go to the city sewer at that point? Yes, yep. So, th so there's uh, a little bit of water used. Um, I don't know the volume, uh, but um, it's less than 1.6 gallons per flush. But yes, they are now using the sewer. Um, so they were required to connect to the sewer um, by, by, by rule um, and then, you know, for backup purposes. But now they're actually using it, which I think makes all the sense in the world. They, you know, we shouldn't be trucking uh, any any type of uh, waste if we don't have to. And we're right in the middle of the city where there's a very functional uh, wastewater collection system. So yeah, so they're using the sewer now. When we went, um, oh, it looks like we've got uh, Jesse. Is that you? And I put your hand or Andrew. Andrew had your hand up. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, how does the county charge you since it's a less concentrated waste or do they, or, or I guess the city actually probably charges you, but I'm just curious, do they charge you a different rate? You know, I don't know um, how they're being charged. It's a good question. So normally, of course, your sewer bill is based on your potable water bill. So the potable water right. bill is zero. Um, of course, they're connected for, uh, for fire suppression, but I haven't used that one. Uh, and so I do not know. I imagine that they've negotiated some sort of flat rate or, um, yeah, I really don't know. Okay, thanks. Um, does the city have curbside um, green waste pickup? Like compost pickup? Does the city? Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe so. So yeah. People who live in Seattle have. Oh, right, right. Oh, Seattle sorry. Curve. I forgot That's about okay. that. Yeah. I don't live in Seattle, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. We, we, yes do. we do. 
Because when we our team went from San Francisco, went up and talked about like the issue of the trucking of the solids and thought, well, if you already have a truck system picking up green waste, you could probably weave in, you know, that same sort of car curbside pickup potentially if you had more decentralized um, composting systems like that. Yeah, I don't know if that had been considered. I, I think that um, it's kind of a moot point now because they don't use the compost toilet right. table, but, but I think there would still be like a little bit of concern by the by the people handling the compost uh, that there was you know even though it's safe um, you'd have to really convince them that it was safe rather than so I think just having King County come by and pick it up was was the you know mm -hmm. was the route they decided to go. Uh, looks like Ben Mare has a comment. Hey there, you Ben. I see your question. Long time no see, Ben. We need to get all these SU grads together. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read out the question for the recording. Sure. Um, so the question is, um, do you have thoughts or advice on the first steps that SBU could take um, to make these kinds of systems more common? Well, I think the the, the barriers to solar I'm not aware of any, so I think that that's that's um, that, that's definitely something that people could do. Although I did hear at one point that um, that the city wanted to limit the number of of folks um, connecting and selling power backs. I don't know if that's still the case because um, they didn't want to have like you know ten thousand points of of entry into the system because that could become unmanageable at some point. Um, but as far as the the water side, so the, the state of Washington just approved, uh, for new construction at least, rules that allow folks to capture potable water, or rather rainwater, and use it for flushing. And so, um, to me, I, I, that is the probably the simplest, the simplest thing that we could ask builders to do is to either use rainwater or um, or gray water to flush toilets. Um, and and for irrigation, I mean that would that would certainly um, cut down on on the uh, on the demands in the future. So I don't know how that you're the expert on how to how to make that happen, but uh, th th those two, those two things seem to be pretty straightforward. Great. Any more hands? Any more questions? I actually have a question. Um, so what um, kind of, uh, I guess, contaminants were you concerned about when you were doing the, um, you know, tests sur surrounding the um, solar panels and, and anything leaching from them? You know, I don't know what they were looking for uh, exactly. It, it just, and, you know, given the fact that no hazardous materials can be allowed uh, in any of the building materials, but uh, of course there are solar panels, you know, uh, are primarily uh, silicon, but um, sure, there's there's some metals in there too. Um, but they so it's probably metal leaching. Um, is what they were concerned about. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know uh, exactly what they tested for. Oh, great. And then we have um, another uh, comment. We have the SU class of 1999. Woo woo. Yeah, <laughs> um, Man, talk about then... someone I haven't seen in forever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, we have another comment. Uh, it, it seems like just a comment, but a uh, first thought I have is I wonder if we can expand the scope of RainWise to include rainwater to toilet applications. Totally. No, I love it. I mean, I, and I think really folks could do that um, at, at the individual household level pretty easily, especially on new construction, um, just to reduce, um, reduce that demand. And then we have... Um, and then we have um, another question that says, any thoughts about how difficult it would be to retrofit buildings to use uh, gray water for flushing? Um, it can be done. <laughs> it, it, each building is going to be, is going to present its own challenges, of course. Um, but you know, I've, I have actually thought about it for, so we have a couple of houses um, that CLU owns. And so I had a, I teach a class called sustainable engineering. Uh, and I had the students work on a project this past winter uh, where they looked at um, doing exactly this and that using gray water or rainwater to flush toilets. And it's actually pretty straightforward depending on uh, where the where the bathroom's located in the building. So 
Yeah, it can be done. Fantastic. I'm not seeing any more hands. Last call for any more questions. Nothing in the chat, Jesse. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciated your talk and um, we'll be making the uh, recording available to folks. Would you mind pulling up your uh, slides so people know where they can get some more notification and contact you? So there it is. Great. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, My everyone. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.